On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, Tesla held its second and now annual AI day, and I've got a recap and analysis of the Optimus bot reveal and the big updates on the team's progress on full self-driving. Plus, Elon Musk talks up a new Cybertruck feature, the Fremont factory expands again, and more. What's happening, friends? Ryan McCaffrey here with you alongside an already snoring Daisy the Boxer for episode 374 of your weekly Tesla unofficial podcast. It's Ride the Lightning for October 2nd, 2022, starting even later than usual tonight because of the AI Day 2022 that just concluded. It concluded at around 9.30 p.m. Pacific. I cut a bunch of clips together Got some stuff prepared for you in addition to everything I already had ready to go for the show. And now 10.05 p.m. I am starting my record. Who knows when I'll finish tonight? It's going to be a long one, but that's okay. Well, uh, the end of tonight, as I'm recording here on September 30th, means that another quarter has come to a close for Tesla. So I hope everybody on the Tesla team was able to get a restful weekend by the time all of you hear this after what was no doubt another sprint to a big quarter's finish line. And on that note, production and delivery numbers for Q3 should almost certainly, like with 99% certainty, arrive in time for next week's show. So that's gonna be something you can automatically pencil in for next week's podcast. Hey, I wanted to start with some follow-up business from last week. I got a lot of responses from the call that Brian in Pennsylvania made on last week's show about his left repeater camera issues at night, specifically in the pitch darkness of night. I want to start by playing one response. This is from Alston in Texas. Hey, Ryan, this is Alston from Texas. I'm calling to in response to Brian's telephone or message about the front left cameras being blocked on dark roads or dark streets. I have had that issue as well. I live in Dallas, but my parents live out in the country in East Texas. And when I do go and visit them, I do receive that same message as well. Um, It seems it's not too much of a bother for me because I'm not there very often. As I said, I live in Dallas with plenty lit up lights, lit streets. But what I'm thinking the issue is, is that It's so dark in some of these places, especially out in rural areas, that I think the cameras have been tricked into thinking that they're being blocked when literally there's just nothing to look at because it is just so dark out there. That's just what I'm thinking that it is because it doesn't happen at any other time and it doesn't happen in the city anywhere else and everything else works perfectly fine. It's just that I think that the cameras are looking for something to look at and have just not been able to find it because it is just so dark and there's no lights anywhere. Could be wrong, could be right, I don't know, but that's kind of what I'm seeing as, like I said, living in Dallas, plenty lit up roads, I don't see it there. It's just when I'm out in a rural area. So that's what I had, that's the take that I had from it, but let me know if you find anything else. Thanks, bye. Thank you, Alston, and thanks to everybody who wrote in or called in about this. What I learned is that Brian is not alone in this. Maybe a buyback, in fact, as I suggested last week, won't solve anything after all for Brian. Uh, I have personally never experienced this, but then again, I've only ever driven in major metro areas, and on the road trips I have taken, I've been along major interstates that are reasonably lit. So, in short... I've learned something new from all of you guys today, which I am genuinely always grateful for. It seems this is a thing, and as such, I have to imagine that Tesla does know about it. And presumably, it's the left repeater specifically because the car is looking for a guiding line on the edge of the road to give it a lane boundary. I don't know if there can or will be a fix. I mean, is there a software adjustment to the camera Kodak that can, uh, excuse me, the camera Kodak, not Kodak, the camera Kodak that can be made or something else. I'm not sure about that, but 
I will bet lunch that Hardware 4 will not suffer from this problem. Not that that's going to help any of you affected by this now. Actually, theoretically, it's we're all affected by this. It's just a matter of if we encounter these kinds of super dark roads. But if some, by some small chance, Tesla wasn't already aware of this, well, thanks to all of you, they are now. And better yet, I want to offer up one more phone call. This is a purported workaround that you can try, courtesy of John from Madison, Wisconsin. Hello, Ryan. This is John from Madison, Wisconsin. Long time, first time. This is in response to Brian from Pennsylvania on your September 25th podcast. I have a 2018 Model 3 upgraded with Hardware 3 and FSD. Our Tesla Club Wisconsin recently had a group camping trip, and this topic came up that three of us were also experiencing. It seems it is almost always the left front camera and is most frequent on dark rural highways when the FSD screen is active. In other words, with the detailed colored road display, not the basic highway autopilot road display. The good news is I have a workaround that seems to work for me. When this starts happening, disengage autopilot, then shut off FSD temporarily. Basic autopilot works well on rural highways most of the time, and the warning about the blocked camera stops occurring. This can be done while driving if you are very careful. In order to re-engage FSD, you have to be in park. I hope this helps Brian and anyone else with this problem. John, thank you very much for that constructive call. Obviously, I'm not able to verify John's suggestion myself since I haven't experienced this, but hopefully those of you that do try that out will find success with it. Good luck to everybody who's been affected by this. Uh, Before I move on to the big topics this week, which as you heard at the top is the AI Day 2022 recap, as well as some interesting little Cybertruck news, I hope all of you ludicrous tier backers and higher on my Patreon enjoyed this week's lightning round bonus mini episode, which was about my last minute predictions for AI Day 2022, which now, if you've got access to it, you can listen back and see how right or wrong I was. Off the top of my head, I think I got a couple of things right. But in fact, the Patreon poll this week, which is available for anyone to vote in, not just Patreon backers, tied into... AI Day 2 as well. It was asking about your interest in the Optimus Tesla bot. Now note, this poll was taken before the event. The question was simply, will you buy an Optimus Tesla bot? I said, assuming it's able to perform common household tasks like washing dishes, vacuuming, sweeping, and yard work, would you buy one as soon as they're available? 39% said, no, I'm not interested at all for the foreseeable future. 25% said, no, I'll wait for the inevitable second generation version. 20% of you said, yes, if it's $10,000 or less. 17% said, yes, if it's $20,000 or less. And as a couple of kind Patreon supporters uh, kindly noted in the comments, I definitely whiffed on, I should have had an option for yes at any price. I, I failed to put that in there. So keep those numbers in mind as I talk a little bit more about the bot here in a second. Uh, And again, if you would like to hear those weekly lightning round bonus mini episodes that are exclusive to Patreon, you can check out my Patreon and that's where you support the podcast. The website is patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. And then one more thing, I'll mention this just a couple more times because it's coming up. TeslaCon Florida happening October 21st and 22nd at Cape Canaveral. I will be there. I've been kindly invited as a guest speaker, featured speaker. You can learn more, get tickets at teslaconflorida.com. All right, AI Day 2022. I've got a very quick and dirty recap and analysis for you here. The event was over three hours long, which I was braced for because I was lucky enough to be Uh, in attendance at last year's. Last year's was also pretty long, so I was very much braced for that. It did bleed into the time that I normally record the podcast here on late on Friday night. So you're basically getting my real-time reactions to this stuff. I have, though, pulled eight clips for you, and I will give you my general thoughts on the event as well. In fact, let me start with those general thoughts, and then I'll play those clips. First of all, uh, it, but to my ear, 
This event seemed even more technical than last year's, which that's not a complaint. It's just an observation. We were clearly warned in advance that this was going to be a technical event. It wasn't a product reveal. It was for recruiting purposes. It was trying, there were smart people in attendance that don't work at Tesla, that Tesla was hoping to recruit into Tesla to help work on this stuff. But yeah, it was so very technical. I think I can reasonably say that I understood less of the presentation this year than I did last year. Now for the Optimus bot, which uh, these clips will cover, don't, don't worry about that. By the way, if you haven't seen the Optimus bot yet, just Google image search it, just look it up real quick. I'm sure you probably already have. If you're, if you're into Tesla enough to be listening to a weekly Tesla podcast, you've probably seen pictures of this thing either on your feed and they're, they've just, you know, other people have, have uh, put them in your feed or you've gone out and sought it out yourself. But the functioning prototype is pretty rudimentary from a visual perspective, which again, was fully expected. Tesla said they got this thing up really in six to nine months. This event was the first time it walked independently without a support cable attached like to its back, but it did. It did successfully walk around the stage. It waved. It did a little like raise the roof dance. Uh, it, it, you know, it moved, it did a good job. Now they also showed videos of it at Tesla, just working at Tesla carrying a box around the office and then in the factory in Fremont picking up uh they picking up some some car parts you could see some i believe they were doors just you know stamped doors behind it uh, and it was i'm not sure what the part it was picking up but it was it was moving some parts from one spot to another and then there was another video of it picking up a watering can and watering a house plant at at one of the local Tesla offices. It didn't look like the factory. And then they trotted out a version two, which doesn't fully move on its own yet. So they just kind of brought it out on wheels, like on a, on a platform. But the version two is definitely much sleeker and much closer to what the production version is going to look like. It's got a very shiny metallic look to it. And as is Elon's way, it's got some humorous Easter egg on, built into it right on, right on the belt. What would be the belt on this thing? It's got a Texas Tesla belt buckle on, uh, which is pretty darn hilarious. I caught that and, and I absolutely chuckled. So mission accomplished by Elon there. And then a couple of other just observations from the event, because it wasn't just the bot. They also talked extensively about FSD and, and the training, the neural networks and, and all the same stuff that they covered last year, just in more depth and with an update, obviously a one year later update this year. So I found it interesting as somebody that works in the video game industry and has seen the really impressive visuals and also the tools that Epic Games has developed with their Unreal Engine 5 software. Uh, it is it is a very impressive piece of technology that can seemingly help get highly detailed, uh, just very visually impressive from not just, a, well, not visually, not just visually, but also uh, it can populate AI. Like Unreal Engine 5 seems like a very robust tool for video game makers. Why am I talking about Unreal Engine 5? Because Tesla is using it to rapidly generate simulated intersections and roads to help feed the neural networks with new training scenarios. So I thought that was pretty cool because at a glance on the live stream, it almost looks real. Like it's, it's granted it's, you know, we're like two screens removed from seeing the direct, you know, the direct actual software, but boy, yeah, from, from a distance, it, it, you could fo be fooled into thinking that this was a real video, but no, it's unreal engine five procedurally generated really cool stuff that they were doing to, to simulate intersections and roads and different road signs and, and uh, lane markings on roads. That was cool. As for dojo, the hardware that's going to power the rapid training of the neural networks that we, we first saw last year, 
There was a, just up on a little, on one of the slides, the Dojo production hardware is targeted for Q1 of 2023. So that is coming along fairly soon. Uh, they, Tesla, we learned, might do, at the very end, they said they might do a monthly podcast about this stuff. So there could be some employees just jumping on and making a podcast about this super deep dive stuff, which I think would be pretty cool. I'd like to see them do that. And then uh, they also, Elon confirmed, they plan to do this event every year, which is probably why this one got renamed to AI Day 2022 at the relative last minute, whereas it had been initially referred to as AI Day 2. And then uh, one thing I was a little, not really frustrated, not like in a genuinely angry or upset way, but I was a little bummed, I'll say, nobody, there was, because the Q&A went on for quite a while. The Q&A was, was long and a lot of questions were asked. Most of the clips that I've pulled for you, in fact, come from the Q&A, but nobody in the Q&A asked about hardware four. If I had been there, that's what I would have gotten in line to ask a question about. Now, maybe Elon wouldn't have said anything about it, but I sure as heck would have tried. And I was, I wish somebody had so that we could try and get an update on when we can expect hardware for, whether it's going to be pretty soon or in, in with the cyber truck in around, you know, eight, six, six to, well, not six, more like eight to nine months from now. And then I would just say, before I play these clips, my big takeaway from at least the autopilot portion of the presentation, because you're going to hear a little bit about the, the bot. And, but from listening to this whole thing, which you don't have to do, it's again, it's extremely dense. It's three hours long. But my big takeaway from the autopilot portion of this is the following. Tesla is doing an unbelievable amount of not just legwork, but first principles legwork in order to make autonomous driving a reality for all of us in the coming years. What do I mean by first principles? Meaning they're, they're white sheet, clean sheet thinking about every step of the way from the dojo chip to the the cabinets that these servers and, and processing, you know, server farms basically are going to be, are going to live in every step of the way they have taken a for Tesla like first principles approach to solving the problem. And I, you know, I can't say this with a hundred percent confidence, but given that no other car company or tech company that I'm aware of has made any public presentations like this, I think it's pretty safe to say that Tesla is just miles, miles and miles ahead of everyone else on this. It's not to say that other people aren't trying, that other people aren't going to have their own solutions, but Tesla is just so far ahead because they're thinking through every single step of this process in a way that, again, I can't say for sure, but it it doesn't seem like a traditional auto company is is th is approaching this stuff with the the neural net training and the hardware that goes into that training and the the you know the software itself i mean it's it's just crazy when that that's my big takeaway as just a lay person who doesn't who didn't understand the technical side of a lot of this but that was my overarching takeaway from it uh all right Let's get to some clips now. Again, I've got eight of them for you. Here is Elon's welcome clip. We've got some really exciting things to show you. Um, I think you'll be pretty impressed. Uh, I do want to set some expectations with respect to uh, our Optimus robot. Um, as, as you know, last year, it was just a person in a robot suit. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we've, now, we've come a long way, and it's, uh, I think we you know, compared to that, it's going to be very impressive. Uh, and um, we're going to talk about uh, the advancements in AI for full self-driving, uh, as well as how they apply to, uh, more generally, to real-world AI problems like a humanoid robot and, and uh, even going beyond that. Um, I think there's some potential that what we're doing here at, at Tesla could uh, make a meaningful contribution to uh, AGI. Um, and... Um, and I think actually Tesla's a good entity to do it from a governance standpoint because we're a publicly traded company. 
we have one class of, sh of, of stock, and that means that the, the public controls Tesla, and I think that's actually a good thing. Um, so if I, if I go crazy, you can fire me. This is important. <laughs> Maybe I've gone crazy, I don't know. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we're, we're gonna talk a lot about um, our progress in AI at autopilot, as well as the progress uh, in, uh, with, with Dojo, and then uh, we're going to bring the team out and uh, do a long Q&A. So you can ask tough questions, um, whatever you'd like, uh, existential questions, technical questions, uh, but we're, we want to have uh, uh, as much time for Q&A as possible. It's a little funny to me how Elon's uh, reaction and his, his feeling on Tesla being a public company versus a private company has evolved a little bit over the years, which again is totally fine. You know, you don't want to just get stuck in one thing and refuse to ever change. But, you know, it wasn't that long ago where he wanted to make Tesla private and bring them private so that he wouldn't have to deal with a lot of the, the you know, the less desirable things that come with being a public company and having to answer to shareholders and, and what have you. But here with the Optimus, clearly he sees that as, kind of a, a public good in terms of the the safety side of it that you know if all right if this if this is a bad thing that public you know the shareholders can demand I don't quite know how we would do that I guess I guess you could ultimately call for a uh, a shareholder vote to remove Elon and then that would be voted on at a at a quarterly you know earnings uh, quarterly shareholder meeting or, or the annual shareholder meeting perhaps but uh, in any case, yeah, I just I thought that was interesting because we've heard him we've heard him say it both ways in the past that he'd rather have the company private, and now that oh well in this case it's actually good that the company is a publicly traded company. The next little clip I've got for you is uh, about a big question, answering a big question: the price. What first a little bit about what it can do, what Optimus can do, and then yes, the price. Take a listen. So here you're seeing. Uh, Optimus with uh, the, the, these are the, with the with the degrees of freedom that we expect to have in Optimus production unit one, uh, which is the ability to move uh, all the fingers independently, uh, move the uh, to have the, the thumb have uh, two degrees of freedom, uh, so it has opposable thumbs, and uh, both left and right hand, so it's able to operate uh, tools and do useful things. Our goal is to make um, a, a useful humanoid robot as quickly as possible, and. Uh, we've also designed it using the same discipline that we use in designing the car, which is to say to, to design it for manufacturing uh, such that it's possible to make the robot at, in, in high volume uh, at low cost uh, with high reliability. So that, that's incredibly important. I mean, you've all seen very impressive humanoid uh, robot demonstrations, um, and that, that's great, but what are they missing? Um, they're missing a brain, they, they, don't, they don't have the, the intelligence to navigate the world uh, by themselves. And they're, they're also very expensive um, and made in low volume. Um, whereas uh, this, this is, Optimus is designed to be an extremely capable robot, but made in, in very high volume, probably ultimately millions of units. Um, and it, it, it is expected to cost much less than a car. I'll just bring so, it directly to the right here. Uh, I would say probably less than $20,000 would be my guess. So there you go, $20,000 or less. So I was uh, reasonably on the money in terms of setting those poll options on the Patreon poll this week. So those of you that voted yes, if it's $20,000 or less, well, you guys should be pretty happy that, uh, that that's indeed the price target for this thing. Uh, all right, what's next? I'm gonna fast forward to the end of the Optimus portion to answer the question, this is, uh, this is from one of the folks on the Optimus team. What is next for this project? Right, so hopefully by now you guys got a good idea of what we've been up to over the past few months. Um, we started having something that's usable, but it's far from being useful. There's still a, a long and exciting road ahead of us. Um, I think the first thing within the next few weeks is to get Optimus at least at par with Bumble C, the other bot prototype you saw earlier, and probably beyond. Um, we're also going to start focusing on the real use case at one of our factories and really going to try to try to uh, uh, nail this down and iron out all the elements needed to deploy this product in the real world. 
I was mentioning earlier, um, you know, indoor navigation, um, graceful form management, or even servicing, all components needed to uh, scale this product up. But um, I don't know about you, but after seeing what we've shown tonight, I'm pretty sure we can get this done within the next few months or years um, and, uh, and make this product a reality and change the entire economy. Um, so I would like to thank the entire Optimus team for all their hard work over the past few months. I think it's pretty amazing. All of this was done in barely six or eight months. When you take a look at where Tesla was last year at the first AI day, when they didn't have anything, they had a person in a suit, and now they have a functioning rudimentary prototype that is really impressive at how quickly they've moved. Throughout the presentation, a lot of the speakers use the term fail fast, which is certainly not new to Silicon Valley and tech companies in general, but it's something that is clearly being uh, taken to heart by this Optimus team and, and they're living by it and they're, they're going through it. And it is, the, the, the progress is super impressive. So it was, it was cool to see this thing. And now let's move to the Q&A. That's again where I've got the next, let's see, the last five clips I've got for you are all from the Q&A. So this next one is, or this first clip I've got for you is about the goal here of, of what this does for the company. We really wanted to show the, the depth and breadth of Tesla in um, artificial intelligence, uh, compute hardware, uh, robotics actuators and, um, and and try to really shift the perception of the company away from uh, you know a lot of people think we're like just a car company or we make cool cars or whatever but uh, they don't have uh, most people have no idea that Tesla is arguably the the leader in real world uh, AI hardware and software um, and that we're building uh, what is arguably the first uh, the, the most radical computer architecture since the, the Crayon supercomputer. And I think if you're interested in developing uh, some, some of the most advanced technology in the world that's going to really affect the world in, in a positive way, uh, Tesla's the, the place to be. He's right. I mean, I think most people have no idea that Tesla has a whole huge software team and a, a hardware, a chip team, all this stuff is really kind of a, a well-kept secret, kind of a, an out in the open, well-kept secret, but they are, they're doing it. I mean, they are just continuing to vertically integrate. It's all, it kind of all comes back to that, doesn't it? They, they vertically integrate and that causes them to get all, into all these new fields and areas and to solve these new problems that, that they think need solving. That the lithium refinery that we talked about recently, that's another area that Tesla's gonna start to get into, thus do you know more and more vertical integration. All right, this next clip, will Optimus get a personality? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I think we wanna have um, f really fun versions of Optimus, um, and uh, so that Opt Optimus can both to be utilitarian and do tasks, but can also be kind of like a friend um, and a buddy and, and um, hang out with you. And uh, I'm sure people will think of all sorts of creative uses for this robot. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, the thing, once you have the core uh, intelligence and actuators figured out, then you can actually, you know, put all sorts of Costumes, I guess, <laughs> on the, on the robot. I mean, you can make the robot look. Uh, if, if, uh, you can skin the robot in many different ways, um, and um, I'm sure people will find uh, very interesting ways to to uh, yeah versions of Optimus. So that's some uh, big Hero Six kind of stuff right there. I mean, that's it's fun to think about the future of this thing. What we're witnessing right now is the like embryonic form of it. And over time, it's going to evolve. It's going to be really interesting to see where it goes. Uh, next up, this was a really good question that somebody asked. Does Optimus deviate from the company's mission of, of accelerating the world's transition to sustainable energy? Yeah, it, I mean, it, it is not strictly speaking, um, Optimus is not strictly speaking uh, directly in line with uh, accelerating sustainable energy, 
it, it, you know, <clears throat> to the degree that it is more efficient at getting things done than, than a person, it, it does, I guess, help with uh, if, you know, sustainable energy. But it, I think the mission effectively does, does somewhat broaden with the advent of Optimus uh, to, uh, you know, I don't know, making the future awesome. So, you know, I think you look at Optimus, and um, I don't know about you, but I, I'm excited to see what Optimus will become. And, you know, this is like, you know, if, if you could, I mean, you can tell, like, any given technology, if, are you, do you want to see what it's like in a year, two years, three years, four years, five years, ten? I'd say for sure. You definitely want to see what, what's happened with Optimus. Um, whereas, you know, a, a bunch of other technologies are, you know, sort of plateaued. Um, I won't name names here, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I think Optimus is going to be incredible in like five years, ten years, like mind blowing. And I'm really interested to see that happen. And I hope you are too. I, for one, am on board with amending the company's mission statement to to include making the future awesome. So Tesla's new mission is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy and make the future awesome. I think that's a good, that's a good addition to a, an already noble and good mission statement for this company. All right, uh, two more clips for you. This next one's about the immediate evolution of the full self-driving beta. What is coming up in the very near term? And by the way, there are now 160,000 people enrolled in the FSD beta. That statistic was given uh, at, during the presentation. It was 2,000 at the first AI day just over a year ago, just by comparison's sake. So here's what's coming up in the very near future if you've got the FSD beta. I, I, we're hopeful to be able to, I, I think from a technical standpoint, um, FSD beta should be, it should be possible to roll, roll out S FSD beta uh, uh, worldwide by the end of this year. Um, uh, but we, you know, from, for a lot of countries, we need regulatory approval. Um, and so we are somewhat gated by the regulatory approval in other countries. Um, but I, you know, I, but I think from a technical standpoint, it will be ready to go uh, to, to a worldwide beta by the end of this year. Uh, and there's quite a big improvement that we're expecting to release next month. Uh, that will be especially good at uh, uh, assessing the velocity of, of fast-moving cross-traffic and, and a bunch of other things. So, anyone want to elaborate? Yeah, I guess so. There used to be a lot of differences between production autopilot and the full self-driving beta, but those differences have been getting smaller and smaller over time. Um, I think just a few months ago, we now use the same vision-only object detection stack in both FSD and in the production autopilot on all vehicles. Um, there's still a few differences, the primary one being the way that we predict lanes right now. Um, so we upgraded the modeling of lanes so that it could handle these more complex geometries like I mentioned in the talk. Um, in production autopilot, we still use a simpler lane model, but we're extending our current FSD beta models to work in all sort of highway scenarios as well. Uh, yeah, and, and the, the, the version of uh, FSD beta that I drive actually does have the integrated stack. So the st uh, it, it uses the FSD stack uh, both in city streets and highway, and uh, it works quite well for me. Uh, but, we, but we need to validate it in all kinds of weather, like heavy rain, snow, dust, um, and, uh, and just make sure it's working uh, as, uh, better than the production stack uh, in, in across a wide range of uh, in environments. Uh, but it was pretty close to that. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, I don't know, maybe, it'll definitely be before the end of the year, and, and may, maybe November. Yeah, in our personal drives, uh, the FSD stack on highway drives already way better than the production stack we have. And we do expect to also include the parking lot stack as a part of the FSD stack before the end of this year. So that will basically bring us to, you sit in the car, in the parking lot, and drive till the end of the parking lot at a parking spot before the end of this year. Yeah, and, and in terms of the, the, like the, 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 fundamental, the fundamental metric to optimize against is um, how many miles per in, uh, between inter, a necessary intervention. So 
um, just uh, massively improving the how many miles the car can drive on, in full autonomy before an intervention is required that is uh, safety critical. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's the fundamental metric that we're measuring uh, every week, and um, we're making radical improvements on that. So it looks like that stack merge is coming. Uh, it's, we, I think we were originally told to expect it back in February, and then the plan changed, but it seems that that's coming in the next couple of months, and the improvements to Auto Park. I wonder if Smart Summon, or AKA Smarter Summon, is gonna be part of that, but that was sort of the, I guess the Auto Park was what seemingly was referenced there. But yeah, some big improvements still coming uh, this year. It won't just be iterative. There will be some significant steps forward that are taken. Again, for me, the, the big thing that I don't like about the production highway uh, autopilot stack is it's just too passive. You make a lane change, it, you know, it suggests, hey, let's, this person in front of us isn't going the speed that, that you wanna go. Let's move over, let's, let's move to the left and pass, okay. And then you, you know, it suggests the lane change, you, you take it, you do it, and then you know, you're doing 63, you wanna do 73, and it takes forever to get up to 73. And more often than not, I'm just punching it on the accelerator to just goose it along. And the FSD stack I've noticed is much more assertive in those kinds of situations. So for me, that's a big thing that I'll look forward to when the stacks are gonna merge. All right, uh, that, oh no, sorry, one more clip, and this is a good one, because what is the timeline for Optimus? We circle back here, one more Optimus question. What does that look like? You're gonna wanna hear this, take a listen. Yeah, I, th I think it'll, it'll, you know, we're gonna start Optimus with very simple tasks in the factory. Um, you know, like maybe just like loading a part, like you saw in the video, loading a part, uh, for, you know, carrying a part from one place to another or loading a part into um, a, a, one of our more conventional robot cells uh, to, you know, uh, that, that welds a body together. So we'll start, you know, just trying to, how do we make it useful at all? Um, and, then, and then gradually expand the number of situations where it's useful. Um, and I think that, that the number of situations where Optimus is useful will, will grow exponentially. Um, like really, really fast. Um, in terms of when people can order one, I don't know, I, I think it's not that far away. Um, well, I think you mean when can people receive one? <laughs> um, so, I don't know, I'm like, I'd say probably within three years, and not more than five years. Within three to five years, you could probably receive an Optimus. All right, there you have it. They're gonna start by beta testing it themselves, kind of like with the Tesla Semi, testing out Optimus in the factory, and then they will move to general production and start shipping them in three to five years, which is pretty cool. All right, I'm gonna talk Cybertruck and more. I've got plenty of podcasts left for you, but first, I'm gonna take a quick break. Be right back after this. I got a nice email this week. Things with AccelerateAuto.com went well enough for them that they want to keep bringing you the podcast. So for the rest of the year, in fact, Ride the Lightning will once again be brought to you by AccelerateAuto.com and their X-Care extended warranties for EVs. The response from all of you guys was so strong, so they're back for more. And that means the $100 off discount code, which by the way is Lightning, remains available for you. But let me tell you real quick about Xcare, just to remind you. In short, the founders of the company, former Tesla guys themselves, they have stepped up to offer an extended service agreement where Tesla no longer does. That means it'll cover things like MCU replacements, onboard computer systems for the Model 3 and the Y, door handles for the Model S is a common one, particularly the older Model S's, AC and HVAC issues, air suspension, and more are all covered on their extended service plan once your factory warranty, four years, 50,000 miles, is up. Xcare is, of course, built specifically for electric vehicles, and they offer plans for up to 10 years 
and up to 175,000 miles with a $100 deductible. Me, I've got a three-year, 40,000-mile plan with them myself. They're also offering leasing for consumers, businesses, and other public entities that are looking for a more creative leasing solution than a cookie-cutter approach. And in fact, unlike Tesla's leases, Accelerate allows you to buy the car at the end of the term if you want to. Learn more, find the right extended warranty plan for you and your Tesla at accelerateauto.com slash xcare. That's X-C-E-L-E-R-A-T-E-A-U-T-O dot com slash X-C-A-R-E. Don't forget to use that discount code lightning for $100 off your purchase. And by the way, uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to them. They will be happy to answer any questions you have. So hit that website, accelerateauto.com slash xcare. All right, back to the podcast, back to the news. I'm not sure if I'm going to have time for any more Ride the Lightning hotline calls. We'll just see how this goes. First, I want to talk to you about the Cybertruck. Elon teased a new Cybertruck feature, and I'm using some serious air quotes right here. I can't imagine it's going to be advertised as a quote-unquote feature, a, a bullet point on the design studio, uh, so as not to encourage people to actually try this, but... Here you go. Unprompted this past week, Elon Musk tweeted, Cybertruck will be waterproof enough to serve briefly as a boat so it can cross rivers, lakes, and even seas that aren't too choppy. It needs to be able to get from Starbase to South Padre Island, which requires crossing the channel. So first of all here, I have questions. First of all, what does briefly mean? I presume it means don't let it sit in the water, keep the truck moving at all times, and immediately exit the water once you've reached your destination. That is my interpretation of what briefly means. I don't know if I'm correct or not, but that's my thinking. If you're curious, I went and took a look at the map. Well, you may be doing the same thing right now. I went and took a look at the map, and if you were to launch a Cybertruck into the water from either the South Bay, which is where Starbase, uh, the Starbase launch facility sits, or from the Gulf of Mexico side on the east edge of Starbase, it looks like it would be about a five to six mile swim uh, all the way around on either side. But if you were to drive all the way down Del Mar Beach, which is on the north side of Starbase, and go across the water at the shortest distance between the two bodies of land, it looks like that is only about a quarter of a mile between the north tip of Del Mar Beach and the south tip of Isla Blanca Beach. I'm guessing that, the, the latter, is what Elon probably meant. The quarter mile swim versus the five to six mile swim. There's a huge difference between the two of those. Now, second of all, him tweeting this effectively guarantees that some YouTuber with enough money to replace their Cybertruck if things go really poorly is absolutely going to try to do this. Again, please don't. I do not recommend it. I don't... It's probably not a good idea. It's almost certain to void any warranties, even though Elon didn't say that in his tweet. But somebody is now going to try this as soon as possible. It will probably, in fact, be a race between multiple YouTubers, whoever can get their Cybertruck delivered first and get it to a body of water to test this out in is probably going to... Well, they're probably going to be... I, I'll just be honest. They're probably going to be rewarded with millions upon millions of views on that video. I'm not going to lie. I would watch that video because I would like to see what happens if you try to use the Cybertruck as a boat. Now, we have seen videos in serious flooding situations of Model 3, uh, well, Model S's for sure, Model X's fording through water, you know, flooded out roads, which again, also, please do not do that if, you, if there is any other alternative, because you don't know if there could be some giant chunk of concrete down on the bottom and where you can't see it, down in the, the dirty, mucky water that's as it's flooding. You don't know what's down there. You could end up uh, 
just wrecking your car. You could end up stuck there. And worst, worst case, I mean, you could drown. Just please do not take your Tesla into any of bo any body of water. Uh, but again, the fact that Elon is putting this out there of his own accord means somebody's going to try this. Somebody's going to get a ton of views on YouTube. And I guess we'll just have to see what happens to the Cybertruck. Now, to pull back from all that, I will say I remain now more than ever very, very eager to hear what updates and additions have been made to the Cybertruck since its original unveiling now almost three years ago. We are coming up. We're less than two months away from the three-year anniversary of the Cybertruck unveiling. I mean, we know for a fact that a lot of work has been done on this thing. And, and I don't just mean, obviously, development work. I'm talking about new features, new things. Quad, you know, the, the design has been tweaked a bit here and there, just, you know, little corners pulled in and the, the lighting and the mirrors and all that stuff, just the, the final details, all that stuff's been worked on, but also features. The, now we, we, we know we're looking at quad motors instead of a tri-motor. We know that four-wheel steering is going to, at the very least, be an option if it's not standard on every single one. Uh, so I can't wait to hear more about the Cybertruck, and that should hopefully happen. I mean, I guess it probably won't happen until the launch event next, you know, the middle of next year. That's, that's my guess on this. But even that still, again, we're like nine months out. We're getting pretty close. Next up this week, uh, elsewhere in the news, the Tesla Fremont factory will be getting a new tent and line upgrades. I saw the story on Inside EVs with a hat tip to the Tesla Motors Reddit, which is where I first saw this. And Inside EVs writes, according to recent filings, Tesla is getting another tent at its Fremont factory. However, it won't be used for vehicle production. The filings also point to assembly line upgrades for the Model S and Model X, as well as an update related to battery production. According to the filings shared with Tesla Rati, the upcoming $140,000, quote, temporary exterior tent, end quote, will not be a place for building cars, though Tesla could change course later. Initially, it seems the new space will be for storing tools. Fremont is out of space, and there's not a whole lot of area around the factory to expand, so these tents have become a welcome option for the automaker. The article goes on to add that Tesla has also been making a number of upgrades to the Model S and Model X lines at the Fremont factory. Tesla Roddy says the automaker installed new automated arms, a frame lifting system, and other related equipment to increase employees, quote, ergonomic safety during production work, which is awesome to hear. Well, I, again, I'm always curious when it comes to Tesla. I guess I probably use the word curious and optimistic and interested. I probably use those words a lot on the podcast, but I am curious what Tesla and Elon, what the team has planned for Fremont long term. And I say that because they're maxing out at 650,000 cars per year there. And that figure comes from their most recent quarterly shareholder report. The new factories, basically all three of the other car factories, can do at least 1 million cars per year when they are ramped up to full capacity, though none of them have quite reached that just yet. I mean, might Tesla maybe eventually move high volume vehicle production out of Fremont entirely, and thus perhaps out of California entirely, over to other factories where the costs are lower and the factory is the latest version of the factory and is thus more efficient, which could combine to make the Model 3 and the Model Y much cheaper to build? Well, I'm not sure if they would quite go to that extreme. But I will say that I could reasonably see a future in which Fremont only makes the Model 3, not the Y, as far as the high-volume vehicles go, and then the S and X as they continue to make... The Fremont makes every single S and X, period, for the entire world. They all come out of Fremont. And then the Roadster, we've been told to expect, will come out of there uh, as well. And then maybe perhaps another vehicle or two in the future that 
aren't necessarily super high volume. Although I suspect that moving forward, Tesla is, at least in the reasonable near future, probably going to focus on vehicle segments where they would be producing in some serious high volumes. But I think more likely is that Tesla will probably figure out an even better solution for expanding the production capacity in Fremont without having to shut down Model Y production in there to make room for something else. I suspect they'll they'll find a way to keep doing the S3, X, and Y in there and add in cars like the very low volume Roadster and some other future products in time. All right, I'm not sure if that snoring from the dog is coming up on the microphone, but uh, if you're hearing a faint snore, it is the dog. I assure you, if you're like, what is that strange sound back there? It is Daisy snoring away because it is, <laughs> I am pushing midnight at this point. That dog is zonked out for the night. Anyway, uh, that is the end of this week's news section. And I, yeah, we've, I've been talking long enough. I am going to hang on to your Ride the Lightning phone calls until next week. So uh, I've got plenty queued up, but if you would like to call in, let me just give you the call in information for that real quick. Uh, Hopefully by now you've got it memorized because I say it just about every episode. But if you would like to call in and talk about, you know, something you heard from the AI Day 2022 recap that I just did or the Cybertruck boat thing, I suspect that will draw a lot of responses and interesting thoughts. So you can call in anytime, day or night. There are two easy ways to do so. Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software Record your question. Please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many calls each week as possible. And then send that file to me via email. And the email address is teslapodcast at gmail.com. Or you can take that same 90 second or less call and actually call in and leave a message on the Ride the Lightning hotline. It's a toll-free number. Dial it anytime, 24-7. And that number is one 888 989-8752. Again, that's 1-888-989-TSLA. Be right back with your pro tip of the week and more right after this. This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief, Sierra 117. You're listening to Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast. You know, that Cybertruck looks a lot like a warthog, doesn't it? Master Chief, out. As for what's happening with me and my car, I am happy to have a clean car again. I washed it last weekend. It had been over a month. It was the dirtiest it had been in quite a while. Uh, I'm also now on new tire watch, officially. My tires were at 6.30 seconds when I went in for my pre-factory warranty expiration service appointment at Tesla back in June. So now that's three months ago, now it's going to be getting close, so... I'm almost sure I'm going to need to get those new shoes before the end of the year. That's not going to feel good on the wallet, but hey, it's just one of those things that you have to do. And and I will say that these tires have lasted a lot longer than I thought they would. I, you know, I'm on the performance, so I know I've I'm I've got to accept my own fate. I know I have uh, tires that don't last as long and they cost a little more. So I'm not looking for any sympathy <laughs> and I'm not complaining. Just noting that, yep, it's it's coming up pretty soon. Uh, hey, how about an entertainment recommendation real quick? And I've probably mentioned this show before, but a new season has begun. Boy, do I love Archer. Archer's on FXX. Uh, I watch it on Hulu. And it is, I just love that show. It is a, definitely an adult cartoon, uh, just really for mostly language, I guess. There's, there's not a lot of uh, visually objectionable stuff in there. But it's a it's about a, a sort of a bumbling super spy, and it is really funny. I love that show. So if you've got Hulu, check it out. Maybe you'll enjoy it. Time for a pro tip of the week. Here's Andy, a former Tesla employee. Hey, Ryan, this is Andy calling. Uh, This is mainly a reply to Peter from Amory, Wisconsin from last week's episode, but it's also a really great tip to anyone that does own a Tesla. I used to work for Tesla, and if you do have any issues in the vehicle, you can actually press the voice command button and say report error, and it will log it in the notes and timestamp it on the vehicle. It is still good to know which date and time that this occurred, so you can just quickly take a screenshot on your phone, nothing uh, specific, but then you'll 
don't have the date and time that it happened. But yeah, press the voice command button and say report error and it will log it in the notes for the text. So the next time you go in, you can say, I have it in the notes. I reported the error on the voice command and they should be able to tag it from there. This is great, Andy. Thank you very much. No notes. Just happy to play this call. And a reminder, too, that if anybody else out there has a pro tip of the week, something useful and interesting about your Tesla that you'd like to share with me and your fellow owners and enthusiasts, please send it in. You can call in with these the same way that you call in to the regular Ride the Lightning hotline, which I told you about a few minutes ago. Before I go, let me mention some friends of the podcast that perhaps could be useful to you. I will start with abstractocean.com, makers of a whole bunch of excellent aftermarket accessories for your car, whether it's the tempered glass screen protectors, whether it's the rear footwell lighting kits, which I especially think are great in the Model Y with the seats that are up on the risers. They've got the drop-in cup holder stabilizer. They've got uh, just all sorts of stuff, and it's you can sort by vehicle. So whichever Tesla you've got, just click on that. It'll show you everything they've got for your Tesla. Again, it's abstractocean.com, and I've got that coupon code for you, 15% off of your first order if you use the coupon code RTL Podcast. All one word on that. And then the snap plate. Don't forget to grab one of those if you are in a state that requires that front license plate be mounted on your car. The one that Tesla gives you with your car sticks to your car quite literally with automotive adhesive. That means if you ever want to take it off, it will not be pretty when it's removed. The snap plate snaps securely on and off, uh, and it'll go on and off quickly as well. It's paint safe, grill safe, radiator safe, autopilot safe, nice, clean, minimalist design. Grab yours for any of the four Teslas currently in production at everyamp.com slash RTL. Meanwhile, budgetsafesolar.com. I am expecting, hopefully next week actually, we'll have the permitting done and I'll have a nice update for you on my solar project with Budget Safe Solar. But in the meantime, uh, they would like you to contact them today if you have the slightest interest in installing solar on your home or business property. Why now? Because, well, anytime soon, your neighborhood may have reached its circuit capacity and not be able to handle another customer supplying the aged infrastructure until repairs are completed who knows how long from now. Don't get shut out because you thought that you had a little more time left in that roof. Visit them today at budgetsafesolar.com. If you do elect to move forward with a solar installation, I humbly ask that you use my referral code, which is RTL. And if you're going to be in the greater San Francisco Bay Area with your car, doesn't even have to be your Tesla, just a car that you care about, why not set it up with a spa day at Immaculate Reflections, just a wonderful detail shop. That's who takes care of me, Jeff McGovern, the owner and proprietor there. He's just a great person and he does incredible work on cars, making them look and stay beautiful. Uh, really, it's if I encourage... Anytime, if you're ever in San Francisco, a lot of you, if you're going to be in San Francisco or the area, you're very nice. You reach out. You want to get together, maybe have a drink, have lunch. I'm always happy to do that. I love meeting all of you because I, as you can tell from week after week of me doing an hour plus Tesla podcast, I love talking about this stuff. So uh, anyway, the point of that is to say, if you ever see my car, you will see how talented Jeff at Immaculate Reflections is. And he's offering a discount to any of you who do book work with him. So go to irdetailing.com to get in touch and, and book your appointment. Whether you want to do ceramic coating, whether you want to do paint protection film on some or all of the car, whether you want to do paint correction, or maybe all three. Maybe you're a crazy in the, in the very best of ways like me because I had all three of those things done to my car. But I'll tell you what, I couldn't be happier. The car, it's, I, I will say I got, just real quick, quick aside, I got the nicest compliment the other day. Uh, I was, I had just washed it like a couple days before, so that helps. But I was in the car, the, the pickup line at picking up my daughter from school and there was a, what I presumed to be a parent because I didn't, if it were to, were, were to be a teacher, I would have recognized them. There was a, a parent volunteer 
coming down the line of cars, just getting names of kids so he could, you know, message back to the to the building to say, okay, you know, let's get this kid ready because their parents are here. Let's, you know, get them out to the, the sidewalk so they can jump right in their car and the line can keep moving. And this gentleman, I had, you know, the passenger window down, he comes up, he says, uh, you just got this brand new? I said, no, it's four years old, almost like 45,000 miles. And he's like, get out. I swear, it, that's, I'm not exaggerating. That is not hyperbole. He thought the car was brand new and that is owed largely to immaculate reflections and the fine work that Jeff does. So again, irdetailing.com, you'll get a discount. Uh, how about puretesla.com slash RTL? Your one-stop shop for your dash cam and sentry mode needs. It's micro SD based, which is designed to put up with the constant reading and writing that the sentry and dash cam require. So I highly recommend this kit. It's just 49 bucks for the 128 gigabyte kit. It shipped free anywhere in the United States, though they will ship worldwide as well. There'll just be a small shipping fee if it's got to be shipped internationally, but uh, ships free anywhere in the U.S. Plug and play, take it straight out of the package, plug it right into your car. Works with Mac or PC when you want to check the footage on your computer. There's also, if you if 128 gig is not sufficient, there is a 256 gigabyte option for $69. Hey, they also sell nice uh, wireless game controller kit if you do a lot of gaming in your Tesla as well. So get either of those products at puretesla.com slash RTL. And then Jada, they're offering their usual lineup of stuff, the Jada USB hub console, which is a storage organizer, USB hub, Apple watch charger, and AirPod charger all in one. There's the Jada tray, which is a drop-in tech-focused center console organizer. And there is, for those of us like me, with the older center console style in the Model 3, there is the wireless charging pad, which they're up to version four of right now. The coupon code there to get yourself a nice discount is RTL. And the website that I would humbly ask that you use is getjada.com slash R-E-F slash eight. And Jada is spelled J-E-D-A. That's my referral link. Full transparency, if you use that link, they'll throw me a couple of bucks from the sale because they know that you'll have come from this podcast. So hopefully you use that link and I give you the discount code via the, the RTL coupon code there. And finally, the Patreon itself, I mentioned it near the top, but again, it's patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. That is the primary way that you can voluntarily choose to support my efforts here at the podcast. This was an especially hectic week. Hopefully the show sounded good. I won't really know until it gets out there and I start getting feedback because normally I'm buttoned up and I'm ready to go well before Friday night rolls around. Like, you know, my, I try to lock it down Thursday. Uh, and then if anything else happens that's interesting on Friday, I'll work that in. But tonight I was <laughs> working right up to the wire and beyond with uh, with AI Day 2022 going so late. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this show. And if you do want to support me, because I'll be honest with you, it, it every little bit helps. Every pledge matters and makes a positive difference in my life, in my family's life. So uh, again, it's patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. Just the, the base tier, five bucks a month, and that'll get you early access to each week's show. I've been seeing more and more very kind and generous people join in at that $10 a month tier, the ludicrous tier. That gets you the early access each week and that weekly bonus lightning round mini episode. So uh, if, if you're interested in supporting the podcast, Patreon is the way to do it. And if you are not already subscribing to the podcast, which is a free thing, just do so on any of your favorite podcast services like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or audio only on YouTube. But if it's just, you know, YouTube's the place you'd prefer to listen to the podcast, go for it. Just search Ride the Lightning Tesla on YouTube. You can email me anytime. The email address is teslapodcast at gmail.com. 
I'm on Twitter and Instagram, same handle on both if you'd care to follow me on either. It's DMC underscore Ryan. And with that, let me say hello and thank you to the grandfathered in plaid level supporters along with the maximum plaid backers and the roadster in space tier backers. I'll start with the roadster in space tier crew this week. Thank you so much for your generosity. Pete White, Lyle Austin, Steve Radspinner, Fernando Cordero, Lawton from Chicago, Sean Neidig, Neil Weaver, Jackson Wallace. Glad Jackson, you were hopefully able to get off that tarmac eventually. He was tweeting the poor guy had landed and was stuck on the, on the, on the, uh, plane for quite a while as always super annoying when you're there you're like all right made it gonna get off gonna go you know either get home or get to my destination and then you're stuck there for a while Uh, but i hope you're doing well jackson and then rolf and jennifer evers howard anthony smith victoria ayacavetto tesla hitchhiker 42 and carol weston thanks as well to the maximum plaid backers they are jonathan wales cameron clark Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, Nick and Tony, the Galpin family, Ryan from Las Vegas, Darren Nickel, Kaz Barnes, Ulrich Lassa, Brett Libano, Patrick Wisneski, Gil Cabrera, Watley, Eric Brown, Mark Eversoll, Todd Badger, Joe Edgel, Kevin Yank, the Tesla Owners Club of San Joaquin Valley, Michael Williams, Will Stedman, Mait Suaru, Derek Nesselrote, Justin Perez, Jeremy Harris, Chris Beach, Tom Mills, Alex Brem, Tyler Smith, Corey O'Donnell, Matthew Graham Droneberger, Scott Gillis, Aaron, John Cody, Andre Kent, Joel Sapp, Kim Bay, Paul Casarino, Richard Corley, Chris Osborne, KB, Matt Asbury, We Drive Tesla EV Luxury Car Rental in Oahu, HaloBengals.com, Chris Pratt, and, oh, excuse me, well, not, not Ann, two more, Ken Epstein, and... Doug Carey. And for uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully chatting with a bunch of the Maximum Plaid crew. By the time all of you hear this, it'll have already happened, but we have our monthly Patreon Zoom hangout for the Maximum Plaid and higher backers where we uh, hang out and chat Tesla for an hour and always have a good time with that. But if you're a Maximum Plaid backer and you're hearing this and you're going, whoops, I couldn't make it, there is a recording of it up there for you on Patreon if you do want to go back and listen. And then finally, the plaid crew. The plaid level is no more, but the plaid level supporters that are still kind enough to be backing at that tier, getting grandfathered in, getting their shout out each week. Thank you very much to George Cassiopo, David Brander, Logan Willis, Jason Chalukas, Tim Hyde, Peter Chalet, Eric Randolph, Dory and Steve Guberman, the Tesla owners of Taiwan, Ron Lee, Charlie Gillespie, David Perella, Dennis Peak. Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, the Lydia family, Aaron Altschul, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, the Tesla Owners East Bay Club, Mike and Barbara from Louisville, David J. Howes, Travis Krenzel, Matt Nixon, the Tesla Owners Club of Wisconsin, Jonathan Zalesny, Ish, Not Elon Musk, T. Kirk Lowry, Peter, the Bear Boys of Colorado, and Raven Wolf Retrotech. And with that, another Ride the Lightning has come to a close. The 374th episode of this show that's now been going over seven years. Very, very proud of that. And there, there's no end in sight. I'm going to keep going and going, hopefully for decades. Because I, I, And I'm serious. I'm being completely serious. I love doing this podcast. I have a great time with it. You guys, the listeners, are so supportive and so kind I just, I love hearing from you. I love uh, getting the the Instagram DMs, the tweets, the emails, the phone calls. It is just a, it is a pleasure to interact with all of you. Because again, we're all just here because we have this shared interest that we're all super enthusiastic about. And so I love making a podcast about it each week. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to that podcast each and every week. And that'll do it. For a snoozing Daisy the Boxer, I'm Ryan McCaffrey. Happy electric motoring, and I'll see you again next week.
I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make it's it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.